have seven kids, one of whom is in the back, and 23 grandchildren, two of which are sitting here, and five great grandkids. And we actually love each other more now than we did even when we were first together, so it can happen. <laughs> and we feel so blessed to be able to come and share with you about what it was like when we grew up. Now, I know you're sitting there looking and you see two little old people up here, but I promise you we were young ones. We really were. And I have pictures to prove it. See, there we go. And then you'll see how cute he was way back then. Yeah, yeah. See? Yeah. He's still cute. He's great. Anyway, um, I just want you to know, we're just people just like you, even though we're a lot older than you guys. And I remember what it was like being a teenager. And is there anybody here that would say that being a teenager or just being alive is easy? Mm, yeah, I didn't think so. It's tough, isn't it? Well, let me encourage you, there's a life after teenage years. You know how you hear when people tell you, oh my gosh, live it up, it's the best years of your life? Wrong. Mm -mm. It's not, I remember, it gets I better when you're a grown up. Yeah, you may have more responsibility, but you have a lot more freedom. And you are dealing with all those weird hormones and all that kind of stuff. So be encouraged. Ooh. There is life after being a teacher. And it's been <laughs> Anyway, um, we were, you've been studying about the civil rights movement, I believe, and all that transpired back then. And I know to you that's like ancient history, but the scary thing is, it was my life <laughs> and his <laughs> life. So that lets you know we are ancient. But uh, it was a different world, just such a different world. When I went to school, um, guys had to wear dress pants, no blue jeans, no shorts, no t-shirts. It had to be a collared shirt, had to be like dress pants, and your shirt had to be tucked in. Girls, mm -mm, no pants. Uh -huh. Nope. You had to wear a dress, and they'd even have a ruler if they thought your dress was too short, and they'd measure it to make sure, you know, it wasn't above your knee, very far, it could only be like an inch or so. It's a whole different world. You know, and there were good things back then, and there were bad things. Just like now, there's good things you deal with, and there's bad things you deal with. It's just life. And it was just different. We dealt with a different set of factors. Now, when you are part of the majority, you know, versus being the minority. Now, I know in California, I believe that it's just a state of minorities now. There's no majority. But uh, when we grew up in West Virginia, the majority were white people. Um, there were some black people. I never saw somebody of Hispanic origin until I was 10 years old and we went to another state and uh, a big city and I saw my first Mexican person and I never did see somebody of Asian origin until we moved to California when I was in my late teens and I never saw anybody from uh, with an Arab origin you know until California I just didn't know and when you are part of the majority you never are faced, you aren't aware of prejudice until it's in your face, until you're made aware of it. Whereas if you're part of the minority, you're always aware of it. You're always aware of where you go, who you are, who's around you, what's going on. And hopefully today will help you understand and see a little bit of what it was like to live back there. My first my first run-in with any type of prejudice wasn't the vicious, angry prejudice that you think of when you look at the uh, 1960s and that whole movement then. It wasn't that, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to fight against you kind of prejudice. It's a subtle prejudice. It's that sense that we, our group, is better than you. You know, just like there was a, um, 
until I was in grade school, the schools had been segregated. If you were black or had any black in you, you went to the black school. If you weren't black and you were white, you went to the white school. But when I was in grade school, they ended up um, integrating the schools so that there was no longer an all-black school. And I like people and I can be friendly and so there was a young black girl that uh, came into our class and she lived down at the bottom of the hill where I lived up on the top of the hill and she wanted somebody to walk to school with her. So I was going to walk to school with her and she came to my house to walk with me, and that was the only day she walked with me. My parents put a stop to it. You just don't do that, Nancy. Well, I was in grade school. I didn't really stop to think why. I didn't question them. I just did what they said. And that was my first little taste of what prejudice was. Then, uh, when we were in, I guess it was junior high school, we started studying about uh, what was going on in the world. And I heard about the prejudice, and I thought, well, that happened either a long time ago, or it happened in, like, way down south, or maybe up in the ghettos of New York, but not where I lived. It never crossed my mind. But we went on a field trip, and um, which, let me tell you, I saw very few black people in school. I mean, they just weren't there, and I'll explain to you why later. So the fact that there was prejudice wasn't in my face, so I didn't think about it. And here we are on a field trip, and I get off of the bus in Virginia, and I look, and there's the restrooms. There's men, there's women, colored. I was stunned that it was actually like that. Now, my parents were not again, aggressively prejudiced, like I said, but it was just that sense what was, well, you don't hang out with the black kids, you don't date the black kids, and you certainly don't marry the black kids. <laughs> you know? But I never questioned it, I never really thought it through, that's just the way it was. You never saw a mixed race couple or anything like that, it just wasn't there. So then when I went to high school, uh, we had a little place that we hung out. It was called Summer's Cafe. And I don't know if you guys have places that the teenagers congregate and gather and all that. But we would go there after school, and we'd all hang around and be bored. You know, we'd listen to the jukebox and smoke cigarettes, because you could smoke back then. Nobody thought anything of it. My parents started buying my cigarettes for me when I was 15. <laughs> you know, everybody just did it. So we'd sit there and smoke cigarettes and drink soda and play the pinball machine because we didn't have video games. And um, little by little, some of the black kids that lived in their town started coming into the uh, cafe. And the owner didn't say anything about it, so we spoke and ca you know, casually, and we made friends with them, and we talked, but we never hung out with them. We weren't buddies with them or anything, but we were friendly with them, you know, chat, like you do, you have kids here that you probably talk to maybe when you're changing classes or at lunchtime, but they aren't your close buds or anything like that. And um, what I realized is by the time they got to high school, a lot of kids just didn't want to deal with the prejudice anymore and being the brunt of the things that would transpire and they drop out of school. When I was, are you guys 10th or 11th? 10th? Yeah, no, I was in 10th grade. And we had biology class. And so we had, uh, they sit us at tables and put us two at a table so we could do gross things like dissect worms and crayfish and things like that. And there was this one girl who was uh, black who was in the class and nobody would sit with her and be her partner. And I thought, well, that's ridiculous. So I sat with her. And uh, she was very nice, but she didn't stick to it long. She just didn't want to deal with it, and she dropped out. Then um, my dad died when I was a junior in high school, and so by the time I was a senior, I had to support myself and had my own uh, apartment while I went to school. And so I worked at night and then went to school in the daytime. Well, when we get through with work, we'd end up going out for breakfast, a whole group of us. And there was this one kid 
than I had met at Summers, you know, and we just hung out and stuff like that. And he'd been on a trip or something and came into the restaurant I was at. And you know how we females are. You know, you see somebody, you know, oh, hi, how are you? You know, and you run over and hug them and stuff like that. That's who we are, right? You know, and so I told him, come on over and sit down with me. And when he sat down, the people that I was eating breakfast with got up and moved because they didn't want to sit with them. Then when I met my husband and I fell in love with him, not because he was black, but because I loved him. And he fell in love with me, not because I was white. He just was white and like me. <laughs> and when we came out here together in 1968, probably even before your parents were born, um, when we came out here, a lot of my family never spoke to me again. They went to their graves not acknowledging me as family because I had dared to marry my husband. When I wrote to my mother and told her that we had gotten married, that we were together and expecting a baby, uh, she said she cried at first. And then she thought, well, why am I crying? She's happy. And then when my mother finally met my husband, she just fell in love with him. I was at work the night that um, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot. And I was just stunned when I had heard about it. You know, I was at work that evening. And somebody there was laughing about it, saying, yeah, yeah, you know, they got him and stuff like that. But, uh, oh my gosh, this is just horrible, just horrible. Well, um, I'm just kind of laying the foundation for you so you can see what it was like for me, from my perspective. Prejudice and all that was not really a daily part of my life because I was the majority. I didn't think about it until I was faced with it. After I met my husband, I realized prejudice is something that a minority, whatever your minority is, that you may have to deal with all the time. People judging you by the color of your skin, by the texture of your hair, by your last name, by where you were born, all these things. But um, as I said, th this story is just, let my story is just laying the foundation for Chuck's story. And um, here he was in West Virginia, black, but it appears that things were going pretty, pretty well for him. Now you guys have MTV, right? And you have the, the music charts like, ah, this is number one, this is number two. They had the big countdowns to yeah. find it out. Well, then they had, uh, it was called the Billboard Charts, and he had a band, and he actually had records that were up in the number three uh, rating. And uh, he was well known. In fact, this is what it looked like. We didn't have iTunes back then, or earbuds. <laughs> we didn't even have CDs. We had 45s. <laughs> this is what we played. <laughs> And you were really fancy if you had a 45 uh, record player in your car, you know, you were really big time then. Although if you went over a bump, it skipped. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway, if it says, uh, where it says the Prodigals, that was the name of his group. And where it says C. Collins, that means he wrote this song as well as uh, being a part of the group that recorded it. And, oh, can you reach it? You're younger than me. Thanks. <laughs> and if you want to pass around, that's what we listen to. And then I want you to hear just a little tiny bit of my sweetheart here. Okay, this is him. This is one of the songs.
Lakia, Lakia, but <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, they, they wrote it up about him, and he was included in that. And then you know how your parents, probably, or probably your grandparents, you might walk by the TV and they have on those PBS specials, you know, about music from the past, and they have the doo-wop specials. And for only three payments of $29.95, you can get this collection. Well, here's some of the collections that he's on. They did re-release his songs, and... Um, if you look at it, you'll see he's on there as, they're on there as the prodigals. Sure. And you would think, uh, here he is, he had these songs out, he had number three records on the chart. He made some good money. In fact, his first royalty check, he got, that it was so large that he took it and went out and bought a brand new car. Imagine if you made that much. It was a brand new convertible that he just paid cash for. It wasn't a down payment, he paid cash. So with all that going, I mean, you hear him, he's talented, he's handsome, you know, he's making big bucks. You'd think life was really smooth and easy and mellow because, I mean, don't you always say, well, if I was just handsomer, cuter, or if I just had money, if I just was well-known and famous, then I'd have it made wrong. You're still just you, and you're still just a human, and you still have to face with whatever situations in your life you deal with. So that being said, even though he was handsome and had money and was famous, life was not perfect for him. So with that, may I introduce to you my beloved Chuck Holland. separate schools. It wasn't like this. Black people went to an all-black school. White people went to an all-white school. And like my wife said, there were separate restrooms. Um, I could not go into a, a, any restroom that, unless it had a sign there that said for colored people only. We were considered as colored people back then. There were, the restrooms were separate. I could not walk into any restaurant that I wanted to and sit down to eat. In fact, uh, in West Virginia, they used to have, um, uh, when we ordered food at a restaurant, we had to go into the back of the restaurant in the alley, and um, they had a little thing that was cut out, and you ordered there, and you, when you, they gave you your food, you put your money on the, the uh, table there because those people do not want to touch you. They could take your money, but they wouldn't touch you. So you laid your money down, and they took your money, and then they gave you your change. Um, when I was coming up, I had to sit in the back of a bus. You couldn't sit anywhere else. And if you were sitting there and the bus wasn't crowded, and some white person got on and went to the back and said, I want your seat, you must get up and give them that seat, no matter what. Um, um, you didn't look white people in the face. When I talked to white people, I had to look at their chin or their cheek, and to this day I have a problem with looking people in the eye when I talk to them because that's the way I had to grow up. And uh, you especially didn't look a white woman in her eye. I mean, these things were, they used to take that nearest tree or that nearest tree right there, and you could see a black person hung on that tree. And it could be in the paper and everything. It could be on television. And nobody cared. Nobody did anything about it. So they, they could do these things to you, and uh, they had no, nothing was going to happen to them. I was not allowed to play with white kids. Up, well, I could play with them up until they were like uh, uh, 11 or 12 years old. But when they came to be a teenager, especially girls, uh, that was a no-no. And if the white girls knew me, if they lived next door to me or something like that, and they were 13 years old and I saw them, they were not allowed to speak to me. It was like I was a non-person. 
we had separate nightclubs. There were black nightclubs, there were white night nightclubs. There were, uh, you had separate churches. I could not walk into a church that was white. It had to be an all black church. Um, when I went to the doctor, the first time that I ever went to a doctor, I was a little kid, and my mother took me there. And um, we were allowed to go into the doctor's office, but we had to sit there all day and wait until everybody else was dealt with before they would deal with us. And I remember going in with my mother, and um, uh, the doctor didn't want to touch her or me, so she had to take his stethoscope and put it on my heart so he could listen because he would not touch me. Um, my earliest remember, uh, memories um, was uh, I was probably three or four years old. And um, these uh, people called the Ku Klux Klan back then. And it was an all white group and they put these white hoods on and with their eyes cut out of them so nobody recognized them. Why? I don't know. But that's the way it was. And uh, so the, the earliest memory I have of that was I was three or four years old. And, um, and why it stands out to me is, is two reasons. One, um, they burned a cross in front of our house. And this was to let all black people know that they were in total control. And it was a fear tactic. And it was working. But um, they burnt this cross in front of our house. And uh, I, I'd never seen anything like that. I didn't know what was going on. But I knew that it was something bad because I had never seen my father afraid of anything. And he was afraid. And my mother turned out all the lights in our house. And she got all the kids and she laid us on the floor. And she told us, she says, be quiet. Don't talk. Don't say anything. Just be quiet. And I sat there and I finally, I said, Mom. And she said, shh, to me like that. Don't talk, don't talk. And so when it was over, when I could talk, I said, Mom, what, 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 what's going on here? What's this all about? The answer that she told me stuck with me for the rest of my life. And what she told me, she said, that there were some very, very ignorant people out tonight. And um, they meant us harm. And this is what we had to do to be able to live, to live for another day. Uh, school was different than what you guys go to. When I went to all black school, we had to dress what they call it proper. And um, uh, Hillary Clinton made a statement that said that it takes a village to raise a family. Black people had to stick together. It wasn't that they did or wanted to, it's that they had to. When we saw somebody black, it was always, hello, how are you? And if we, we, were, we learned from an early age to tip our hats, if we had hats on and we were men to women, uh, we learned to, to obey, uh, we learned to respect uh, women and our elders. When I was a kid, you, as a boy, you would never hear of a boy saying a curse word in front of a girl. And it didn't matter where you were at, even if I was 20 miles away from where I lived and I said a curse word in front of a girl and a black man heard me, he would hit me in my mouth because that was not tolerated in our community. We uh, could only go to a carnival on Saturdays. It's the only time that we allowed. We couldn't play in a park, a public park, as long as white kids were there. We could only go if there weren't white kids. And if a white kid came, then we had to quit doing what we were doing to leave. Um, my brother played in a band. He was a trumpet player with Bob Hope, which you probably never heard of. But Bob Hope was a very famous person then. Anyhow, he played trumpet. And uh, I was five years old. And uh, he rented this hall in our, in our city. And uh, he was playing his music. And so just like any other place like that, there's times that you have uh, fights because of the liquor that's consumed. There were fights there. And uh, I was five years old, and uh, my brother went on a break. And a uh, fight broke out, and it was all black. And uh, this one man took out this razor that he had, and that's what everybody carried, and he cut him from one side to the other, 
till his guts began to spill out from the sidewalk. So he was laying there in a pool of blood like that, and they called the police. And the police came, and the policeman joked about it and was telling the guy that did the, the cutting, he says, look what you did to this. Why do you do this to this guy? Now we're going to have to arrest you. And he was joking about it until the man bled to death and died on the sidewalk because nobody cared. I saw, at five years old, that's when that happened, I saw men cut up, their bodies totally cut up and laid on a railroad track simply because this man had enough nerve to talk back to a white woman. So, when I used to walk down the street in my hometown, the white people there used to sick their dogs on me. They'd make their dogs come out and bite me. I wasn't allowed to defend myself. If I would have picked up a rock or stick or something to, to uh, uh, defend myself from that dog, if I hit that dog with that, I'd be in more trouble than letting that dog bite me. So what I had to do, I had to withstand that dog or learn how to run and run real fast. And they loved that because then they would say, oh, look at that boy run, look at that boy run. Of course, they wouldn't call me boy, they'd use the N-word. So anyhow, that's the kind of life that I was growing up in. And I was telling myself, somehow, I've got to find some place that isn't like this. But there was no place. There was no place I could go. So when I got the records out, and put these records out, people began to want to be around this group. And it did, our music did such a strange thing back then. It started bringing people together. And we started bringing white people together and black people together. Back in those days, like if we were doing a concert in here, they'd have a rope that was tied in the middle of the room. All the white people were on this side, the black people were on this side, and you not, were not allowed to to intermingle with one another. Um, of course, the places we played, there was no black people because they were afraid to come. So anyhow, uh, I played for the government uh, in West Virginia, and uh, we were guests for the governor of West Virginia. And we, we were the entertainment. When they took, when I went to the resort that we were to perform in, they took us in the back door. They took us through the kitchen. And in the kitchen, they had a table set up that the entertainment could eat at. That's where we had to eat, because we were not allowed to associate with the white people. Wherever we traveled, from city to city, you had to stay in an all-black motel, and they were very rare. You could not stay in a white motel. You couldn't do it. So if they didn't have a black motel, you slept in your car. And so those are the kind of things that I was experiencing growing up and trying to get out of it and saying this music is a way out for me, even at that early age. That's the way I was thinking. So we get the records out. And before that, the police were used to make me and the rest of the band come to meetings that they set up. And they would always say to me, they'd pick me out. They'd say, one of these days, we're going to get you. One of these days, you're going to trip up and we're going to get you. So I had the records out, doing well. And what happens to me? One day I hear a knock on my door and the police come in. They arrested me for dating a white girl. I was 15 years old, she was 14. So I was arrested for dating her. So they take me to jail, and my mother is putting her house up so she can afford a lawyer to get me out. And this lawyer comes in, about 15 years old, he says, um, you know, we're going to have to change what they're trying to get you for. He says, we're going to have to change that. We're going to have to change it to statutory rape. And I looked at him and I said, you must think I'm stupid or something, man. And I asked him, what does statutory rape mean? What is that? So he explained it to me, and it was a 10-year flat sentence from 10 years to the death penalty. The death penalty in West Virginia was, 
that back in those days that they set you in an electric chair, an electric unit. So here I am sitting in jail, and I told my mother, I said, Mom, don't put your house up. They're going to keep me in this jail. There's nothing that anybody can do about it. This is what I must go through. So they put me in jail. When they took me in jail, I'll never forget when I got to the, they opened up this first big, huge iron door, and they read me this thing that said, you are no longer a citizen of the United States. You have no name. You belong to us. And then they locked that door. And then they sent me through this other door that I was in the jail, 15 years old. They threw me in a range back then that they called the criminal range. What that meant, they were there for one purpose, to be executed. So that's where they put me at, with all these criminals. And I kept thinking, this is the day I'm going to die. So when I go in, I'm going to use my West Virginia accent to explain this. I go in there, and I'm thinking about I'm going to die. And this one little guy about this tall walks up to me, and he said, You're the guy that I've been reading about in the newspaper. <laughs> that uh, uh, you was dating them white girls, huh? Like that. He right. says, Oh, boy, this is the last time you're going to live. And he laughed. He says, and the reason is because back in that cell there, the guy that runs this place told us, he's asleep right now, but he told us that we can't do nothing to you until he talks to you. And you're going to die when he talks to you. So I was sitting there, and all, this, all these white guys sitting there. And I kept thinking about my life. 15 years old. I never expected to live to be 30 anyhow. But I kept thinking, okay, I'm 15 years old. What have I accomplished in life? Nothing. And it's over. So the guy wakes up and he looks over and this little guy that was talking to him runs over and he's talking to him. So the guy looks at me and this guy had the coldest eyes I had ever seen in my life. He was about 6'5", he weighed about 260-something, and he was white, of course. And so what he did is he came over to me and says, Oh, you're the guy, huh? I said, Yeah, that's me. So he says, I'm going to play a game of cards with you. And he said, When this card game is over, this is the last day that you'll ever see. I didn't know this. This guy was to be executed because he had killed nine people with his bare hands. So anyhow, he set this deck of cards up, and I sat down with him to play this game of cards. And I kept thinking, I'm going to die. Soon when this hand is over, I'm going to die. And in the course of that game, the man looked at me and he says, let me ask you something. He said, did you really date them white girls? And I said, yes, I did. And this guy jumps up out of his chair and he swings his arm on that table and he hits it, bam, like that. And he gets up and he goes to me and he points to me and he says, I like you. That's right. Like that. And he says to me, I'm, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm dead. And he says, and I like you because you weren't afraid to tell me the truth. He didn't know I was scared to death. I was petrified. All of my life, for 15 years, I lived in fear constantly of if I go outside, I can die. If I walk down the street and I do something or look wrong, I could die. He just didn't know this, but God's hand was on me. And he used that to get this guy to keep me alive. Well, this guy was to be executed. So he was there. I was, uh, while he was there, I was cool. He told me, nobody bother him. He's cool. <laughs> so I walked around that jail. Nobody bothered him. So one day he comes up to me and he says, you know, Chuck, next, uh, uh, next week, that's it for me. And he says, uh, they're coming to get me and they're going to execute me in the electric chair. And, um, you know, Chuck, it's okay. And he says, come here, I'm going to show you something. And he 
takes his pillow up and he pulls this gun out. Mm. He says, I could escape here anytime I wanted to. He says, but you know what? He says, I've killed so many people in my bare hands. I know that if I get out, I'm going to do it again. So I just have to go back over this again. So I just want to die. That's what he said to me. So I kept thinking, okay, next week, it's over with for me because I was in there for one year. And I'm thinking, next year, next week, it's over with for me. And they took him out. And I hear this voice as they were taking him out. They were bringing another prisoner in. And I, kept, I heard this voice. Is Chuck Collins here? And I recognized the voice. It was an Italian mafia man. And uh, in the music business back then, the Italian mafia ran the music business. So I had made this man a fortune in his life. So once again, God was with me. When that guy went out, he came in, and it was hands off for me. So that's the kind of life that uh, that we lived back then, and, and in fear like that. Now, what do I want to leave with you today? Is this, if I can leave anything. I have learned from what my mother told me, laying on that floor, that um, she told me that there were ignorant people out tonight, not white people. There were ignorant people out tonight who meant us harm. And this is what we had to do in order to live. I never looked at white people the way that a lot of people did. I take people as they are. So what can I leave to you is this, that there's only one race of people. all the horrible stuff that was going on because I was part of the majority. It wasn't until after I married him that I realized what it was really like. And as I started learning about it and hearing about it and realizing what had really transpired and what was still going on, I was mortified. I was, I was just sickened and ashamed that I was white. I thought, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But then as I began to learn more, I realized, and I now know, it's not all white people. I mean, here I am. Oh, okay. You know, <laughs> there's always a small group of people amongst everybody who wants to be a jerk. You know, you cannot judge everybody by the few that act so terrible. You just cannot. And you think, if you have a room full of toddlers and, or even just little kids, and you have one or two brats and the rest are nice, who do you notice? The one or two brats, right? Yeah. Well, that's the way with people. You know, there's always somebody who's going to be terrible. But I hadn't learned of all the white people that had fought against prejudice. Lana First, there were those people who risked their lives and the lives of their family to smuggle people on the Underground Railroad to get to black people to freedom during slavery days. I, at first, I hadn't learned of all the countless people who fought and stood and raised money to be able to send people to the legislature to be able to change the laws and to change the way things work. I mean, there were countless, countless people that have helped along the way. It was just some that were prejudiced, some that were jerks. And as Chuck said, I hope each of you, I hope that some of what we shared will help you see that we are truly, truly just one race of people, the human race. If you take everything that makes it up us being human, say that's 100% human, what varies with their ethnicity. What we would say makes us different as far as race is concerned is less than 1%. It's like 0.01%. It's something like the fat on your eye. 
the amount of pigment you have in your skin, you know, whether or not your hair curls uh, or is straight. I mean, stupid things, whether you're redhead or have dark hair. Because I don't know if you realize it or not, but in the late 1800s and early 1900s, Irish people were treated as less than human. They had caricatures of saying how they were subhuman and they uh, couldn't get decent jobs and they were persecuted terribly. I mean, it's always going to be that way where people are judging people by what they look like or by where they were born or what group they're with. And you have to really and truly start looking at people as people instead of looking at them and judging them by where they came from, what their ethnic background is, what their last name is. Um, I know now, nowadays, um, I'm sure the people from the Middle East are experiencing a lot of prejudice. I mean, people get on, and I know of some idiot who was getting on a plane and caused a scene because there was somebody um, who appeared to be from the Middle East. And they got in, that person got in the person's face about it. And they had to take the man off of the airplane because he was being stupid. He was judging one person by what a few did. Or, oh, I know time's almost up. I just really want you to see, hmm? I want you to see we are all just human beings. We all have happiness. We all have joys. We have sorrows. We have fears. We have doubts. And cut the other person some slack. You know, when you see someone, you don't know why maybe they're behaving as they did. Our youngest son, it was seven years ago, uh, was out in front of our house, and um, some Hispanic people shot him five times. He lived, thankfully, but they were intending to kill him. It was their intention. They stood over him after they shot him in the leg so he couldn't run and plowed a 45 into his chest. I still have the bullet. You know, one of them that they had to take out of him. They intended to kill him. If they didn't even know him, uh, and they intended to kill him. Now, does that mean that all Hispanic people are jerks, killers? No. It was that one person that did that? Well, actually, there was two. <laughs> but it was them. It was only them. I have grandkids that are Mexican, you know, or part Mexican. Does that mean they're all like that? No. Just a few. So I want you to know, don't judge people as a group. Look at them as individuals and give them opportunity to prove themselves to you for who they are. And I think time is almost up. Does anybody have any questions? No? Do we still love each other? Yes. <laughs> Not even what? Gosh, OK. Well, in that case, I want to ask how old were you when Emmett Till I'm sorry? Emmett Till. How old were you? How old were they killed who? Emmett Till. Oh. I, was, I was probably 15, 16. So I was just a little girl. There's a few years. <laughs> and that's something I didn't get to share. We we started set-ins in my hometown too. We would go into the restaurants and um, we would that we weren't allowed to go into. We started going into them anyhow, and uh, we had to take the abuse of people spitting in our face, calling us the N-word, coming up and hitting us. But um, we were determined that nobody was ever tell us that we could live. And it's not because I was brave. I wasn't a hero. I was scared to death every day of my life. So it wasn't that all oh, bad. I was just, wow, I'm so bad, you know. Ain't nobody gonna do nothing to me. That's not the way it was. I was, I was scared to death when I went into my first restaurant. Scared to death when I went into my second one. But it's something I had to do because there was something about that that was bigger than me, that was more important than 
how I felt, whether I lived or died. Uh, it was, this was bigger than that. So um, I came to that conclusion. And by the way, I never would have come to that conclusion had not God been on my side. Never. Um, even though I didn't acknowledge him back then. Um, but that's who kept me alive. And please, keep this in your thoughts all the time. That there's only one race of people. I don't care what you're taught. Who's telling you? Doesn't matter. There's only one race. And it's called the human race. I have one other little prejudice that I have seen springing up. Because again, you don't realize it unless you're the brunt of it or it's brought to your face. But prejudice against old people. And now that yes. I'm old, you know, you look at an older person, and I was guilty of it. Oh, aren't they dear? Oh, you know, and it's almost as if you're talking down to them. You have no idea what that person has done, how they've lived, what they've accomplished, what they know. You just think of them as almost like a little child. So next time you see an old person with some gray hair or have their gray hair colored like mine, <laughs> just realize they're just people too and they've done a lot of living to get that old, you know, yes. and they've experienced a lot of life. Well, that's, that's true. I, I'm, we're both experiencing that now that we're there. Um, it, it feels a lot like when I was... Thank you guys so much.